director of the National Telehealth Technology Assessment Resource Center in Okinawan and Palm Max CPAC. Um, after the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, which if I had to refer to that, I'd call it NPHC. Um, at TTAC here, I research and evaluate technology used in delivery of telehealth services, and then he writes and presents extensively on his experiences. Garrett's interests span anthropology to technology and include human computer interactions, culturally competent implementation of technology, and how technology is used by and used by and for underserved populations. He received a BA in English from Seattle Pacific University and his MA in Social Science from the University of Chicago. Garrett has 13 years of experience in telehealth with a background spanning the testing and development of storm forward software and video conferencing pro products, and equipment selection and deployment, and more recently, education and outreach um, on the topic of technology assessment. So Garrett, uh, take it away. All righty. Uh so uh, today I'm here to talk about technology assessment in the age of mobile, um, where uh, the, the work that TTAC does kind of touches on a, a whole lot of technology. But lately, in, in the last year and a half to two years, we've been spending a lot of time looking at what's taking place in the mobile space. So we're going to provide some thoughts uh, from what I'm referring to as the trenches and benches. Uh, from you know different programs that I've seen that are actually de deploying the technology issues we're seeing there as well as all the stuff that we're seeing from our test bench where we're bringing a lot of equipment in and doing a lot of testing so uh, we'll, we'll cover a, a, a fairly broad scope of mHealth issues but really trying to key in on some of the issues of technology assessment specifically related to mobile health See, it's not navigating like it usually does. Is that the pointer or on Garrett? I wonder if that's on the screen. There we go. It, it, it's uh, proceeding now. OK. So um, when I usually talk about mHealth, I, I like to usually speak to kind of how mobile devices have evolved. And usually when I do that, I, I very much focus on the phone itself. And I, I've lately been realizing that just focusing on the development of uh, cellular technology isn't itself really sufficient to talk about kind of how we got to the place that we're at with mobile technology. Because really what we're talking about when we talk about uh, uh, mHealth these days really is the, the, the kind of uh, joining together of uh, computing technology and, and very small computers with cellular uh, telecommunications technology. So, so it's important to track both the phone as well as the, the trends in computer development over time. So, so we'll start here talking about kind of some of the early uh, large computers, the, the, the mainframe days, where an individual organization, or, or in some cases a, a consortium of organizations, would get together and they would have a single computer that they would use uh, amongst themselves. And there would be a computer room that had that was kind of restricted to uh, uh, those that were trained on how to use the system. And it wasn't necessarily widely uh, distributed. And this worked fantastically well. Great things were done. Uh, and we were able to see uh, you know, the kind of the, the dawning of the computer age here. And as this technology continued to improve and, and a few kind of groundbreaking things took place uh, that developed uh, and led to the development of the desktop computer. Now, if we look at this transition period from uh, mainframes to personal computers, th there was a bit of a disconnect. A, a lot of the individuals who had been doing this uh, uh, mainframe computing, really, they didn't always see the utility or, or the need to have a computer in everybody's office, in everybody's home. Uh, it, it made sense to them to have their computer room. Uh, that said, clearly, uh, desktop computing took off in an enormous way. Uh, and the technology improved drastically over time to the point where they're absolutely ubiquitous here, at least in uh, the, the developed and developing world. Uh, and so we, we have we saw the shift then from computers being uh, a, a, a very expensive resource off somewhere else to a less expensive resource that you had uh, kind of more centrally located and available uh, kind of in your own space. 
Now, this was, again, a, a, a fairly significant shift that continued on into the laptop, where, uh, once more, this was a, a bit of a, a kind of paradigm shift for folks. And the connection wasn't always made. There were plenty of people that had desktops that said, why would I want an underpowered device that has you know, lower specifications, uh, an underperforming battery, there's no real need for it. And it's quite true. Early on, there were very few use cases for laptops um, in the general public. But as the technology matured and as use cases became kind of more clarified, we're at a point now where desktop sales are plummeting because people are finding more and more portable and mobile ways of having access to their computers. So whether it's through uh, smaller and smaller laptops to moving into tablets now, where we have a lot of computing capacity in this uh, very portable uh, space. So it's no longer just a personal computer. It's a personal computer that you always have with you. It's, it's capable of being with you all of the time. And that shift from uh, computer resource in a single room to computer resource that you always have with you is pretty drastic. And that, I think, kind of marries nicely with the trend that we also saw in uh, uh, the development of, of cellular technology and cell phones. Early on, there were a limited number of sites that you could actually use a cell phone. Uh, the, the deployment of the cell towers uh, took off in, in certain uh, financial and business areas, uh, and it made sense for certain users, but I mean, there were some problems. The, the battery life was abysmal. Uh, you, you're looking at you know 20 to 30 minutes of talk time and then multiple hours of recharging. Uh, the, the reception wasn't really all that great. You had limited range. Uh, not that far removed from, say, the mainframe where there's a clear space that you could use this phone and only a couple of clear use cases for it. Now, they obviously remedied that uh, by improving the capacity of these devices. And so it went from being uh, a device with limited functionality to these kind of larger phones, briefcase phones, car phones, where the battery was larger, the antennas were more powerful, and so the range was increased. And so they began to kind of develop a set of functionality that was, I guess, more understandable and more uh, comprehensible to the general public. And so people began buying into the phone, and this then turned into smaller and smaller devices as the technology improved. And this year moved to the, the, the flip phones and the little candy bar phones and the bricks. Th that shift is quite significant if we look at how people were using technology. I and mean, we'd gone from a point where you had a phone in your home, you had a phone in your office, maybe you had a car phone, to now you were, had a piece of technology that was with you essentially all of the time. And that brought about some changes in usage and changes in, in behavior that are quite significant. And it becomes increasingly more significant as we look at the, the combination of uh, uh, behavior changes, uh, improved connectivity via cellular networks that are improving, and then smaller and smaller uh, uh, computers where we, we develop the smartphone. Now, this was in 2007, the iPhone came out. It was a revolutionary uh, product. Not to discredit BlackBerry and uh, the, the various PDAs of the time that were quite feature rich. The, the issue is that this was not just focusing on business users or a handful of kind of corner case users. This was absolutely focused on the consumer. Uh, consumers were expected to buy these phones and use them, and they clearly have done so with you know buying new phones every year or two. Uh, and there's this constant upgrade cycle now, and consumers are totally dialed into this mobile movement where they have access to a, a, a phone and a computer all the time, which also now means that we have access to our patients and to our providers all of the time via these devices. But we're still at this kind of awkward transition phase, I would say, uh, at least within healthcare, where there hasn't been that clear use case for mHealth. I mean, there are definitely uh, some cases I'll talk about here and ways that it's being used, but we're still really trying to figure it out. It's a very young industry, if you think about it, in the grand scheme of telehealth. Uh, this is um, very new, but it's also very disruptive and can possibly lead to some very interesting things. But it also introduces some confounding issues. It's difficult to figure out what it all is on the market because it's become so popular and so consumer-driven, there's just a high rate of change. And so we'll talk about the complexities that we're really dealing with as we look at mHealth development here in the slides ahead. So today, we're going to define mHealth, uh, look at some of the programs and technology that are used generally just to make sure we're kind of on the same page. And then I'll, I'll kind of sum up at a fairly high level the things that we've seen from the test lab 
uh, just a couple of slides here because there are just a few takeaway points that we see across the field. And then we're going to spend probably the last uh, third to quarter of the, the talk looking at the role of technology assessment and how to do it in the, in the mobile space. The TTAC really advocates having a rigorous uh, assessment process, and, and I think this absolutely holds, uh, holds up to uh, the, the mobile market as well. So <clears throat> in defining mHealth, uh, you can look at a few different definitions from some of the larger organizations out there. Uh, we have the World Health Organization, the National Institutes of Health, and the mHealth Alliance. Uh, all three of them have been developing various definitions since, I believe, 2011. But the issue is, is that you know, I find these definitions to basically be saying that mHealth is using a mobile device for health-related purposes, which is kind of this circular definition where you're saying mobile health is mobile health. Uh, and not, not to you know, harp on those definitions too much, because I get what they're trying to do. They don't want to be overly confining or restrictive in their definition. But I keep struggling with this, because if I give any given provider a definition of mHealth like that, they won't really necessarily know how to conceive of mHealth in practice. So I think it's important to really consider mHealth uh, in practice in defining it. Uh, and this is obviously going to be changing as use cases develop and change. But for now, I find it to be a little more productive to say that really there are a few distinct use cases uh, that, that, M, that are kind of encapsulated within mHealth. The three that I'm focusing on primarily these days are provider-centric data capture, uh, patient-provider communication and ways that that's facilitated, and patient-oriented data capture. Now, before I define these more clearly, I do have to admit that there are obviously a lot of other ways that mHealth can be used uh, and mobile devices can be applied to healthcare, whether it's providing access to data, uh, offering video conferencing services, basic general computing on a phone, being able to access a whole host of references and resources uh, kind of on your person all the time, those are all great. And the issue here that I, I don't want to get too caught up on those right now, that those are not necessarily uh, uh, paradigm changes. They're simply a, a, the natural evolution of smaller and smaller computers. I mean, you could be doing this same data access video conferencing and computing on a smartphone, a tablet, a laptop, a desktop, what have you. What I really want to focus on are the ways that we're changing how healthcare can be delivered uh, just through the device itself and through the new ways it can be used. So here looking at provider-centric provider data capture, uh, and excuse me for the, the slight uh, formatting issue here with the, the clipped text, uh, what we're looking at are the uh, imaging and monitoring devices uh, uh, quite extensively. Uh, there are a lot of uh, products coming out now that attach to, say, the iPhone camera. So you can you have ophthalmoscopes, otoscopes, uh, derm cameras. Uh, there's a growing number of devices that take advantage of the built-in imaging capacity on these smartphones. Now, there are other devices out there, uh, EKGs. Um, the, the, the list is actually quite extensive, scales, various biometric uh, data gathering devices that all attach to various smartphones. And the goal here is to give the tools to a clinician that they can capture data kind of with the, the devices they have on themselves. Or they, they no longer have to go to the telemedicine room to be able to do telemedicine. They can pull something out of their pocket, do a, a quick exam, document it as needed, and, and kind of move it forward in their clinical environment. Uh, and the data is typically going to be staying with a physician, um, maybe within other health systems that they have, or, or get sent on to other providers, but it's uh, more uh, clinician-centric. <clears throat> now, one important thing to note here with a lot of these devices in this category are that the, uh, the, there's an issue with the form factor right now uh, in that Apple is, is doing quite well in controlling the product uh, design. So there are a limited number of iPhone designs and sizes that a, uh, a peripheral manufacturer needs to support. And so this makes it very easy to create new products that will reach a wide audience. Or if you contrast, contrast that with, say, the Android market, where you have a lot of manufacturers producing many models of phone, it's harder to create these kind of custom cases for so many products. So right now, I am seeing more development uh, in this field uh, kind of in the Apple market. But there are definitely some happening within the Android market. Uh, but, but I would say kind of, if we're playing a numbers game, Apple is slightly ahead here. 
Now, if we move from this, this provider-centric uh, uh, definition of mHealth to one that is looking at facilitating communication uh, between patients and providers, the, we're still looking at monitoring devices uh, quite extensively. So you, you have blood pressure monitors, scales, spirometers, again, the, the, the whole host of, of peripherals. Uh, but you also have some situations where you're just dealing with applications, software applications on the phone. Um, the, the phone might be putting data out to a server that then gets sent to a website somewhere. There are a whole host of ways that these applications function. The, the big thing here, though, is the applications are focused on getting data from the patient to a provider or from the provider down to a patient. Um, there, a lot of these systems are meant to be used by the patient or uh, caregiver, whether that is a family member or a, uh, uh, a uh, someone in the assisted living facilities. Uh, and it, a lot of the models that we see here are focusing on getting the data uh, from the patient, uh, you know, whether we're tracking the blood pressure and weight or what have you, uh, sending it on for usually triage somewhere where you have a, uh, a service provider that has nurses on staff that can review data and they kind of flag any of the uh, uh, re numbers that are coming back that are alarming uh, and then send congratulations essentially back to the uh, compliant patients with good numbers. And so there's a kind of middle uh, 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 middleman helping to move data uh, onto the provider. And so the provider is not necessarily getting flooded with data from all of these, these patients, but they are able to see data and kind of dig into a whole host of, of uh, data sets for their patients. And here, the, the, the last little point is, is quite important. The data is being sent by the patient to the provider, where, where you don't necessarily have a skilled clinician gathering the data. And this is a very challenging thing in the world of telehealth for a couple of reasons, uh, reimbursement being an issue, uh, given that a lot of uh, reimbursement is focusing on the uh, uh, originating site. If you don't have uh, uh, a physician at that site, you can't bill for it. Um, and so, and there are also other questions of you know, the quality of the data. Is, is a patient really qualified to be uh, reliably capturing data? So, so a whole host of questions are being kind of wrestled with here. Uh, and, and again, while we're in this transition period, these are going to be very natural questions to figure out. Um, but, but it offers a lot of potential and a lot of hope. Now, the, the last section that, or last kind of area I like to define is the patient-oriented data capture. Still, again, talking about these monitoring devices and applications still talking about them being used by the patient or caregiver. But here, we're no longer so concerned about sending the data from the patient to a provider, at least not kind of in the, in the same uh, almost real-time feed that you might expect with, say, the uh, patient-provider communication systems. The, the, these may be electronic logs, essentially, where a patient can capture all of the data. They can see it on pretty charts. They can share it with family and friends. Uh, and then when they go into their clinician, they can pull up their, their data and show it in a very clear and concise manner, as opposed to pulling together different pages of their log, if they're doing uh, any kind of logging or journaling of their, their health data. Uh, and here, this is kind of one of the, the big takeaways that, that we're getting at with the kind of move to mobile, is that a patient is more likely to have their mobile device on their person than, say, a log book and a pen and a paper and remember to do that. Whereas if their, device, if their phone is always with them, ideally we have a better chance of accessing the patient and getting their data from them in a timely manner and getting it in a consistent way. And as more and more devices speak to consumer uh, phones and patients' phones, we're able to then get that data transfer process automated. So they're no longer having to manually enter data in. It's just being sent in automatically, which helps reduce the, the kind of friction that takes place in getting a, a patient to really be compliant in, in monitoring their own health. So, so again, those are the three areas that I'm mostly focusing on. Uh, Provider-oriented uh, data capture, patient-oriented data capture, and then that patient-provider communication. Now, yes, there are other ways of using mHealth, but this is where most of the activity and noise is that I'm really uh, seeing, and, and where a lot of the, the difficulty is for patients and providers both. Now, the programs that are developed here in, in the mHealth world, there are a lot of them. Um, but there are three primary ones here that I'm going to focus on uh, because I, I've seen a lot of questions around them or a lot of publications around successful programs using these various systems. Uh, the SMS texting, your, your, your uh, very simple text messages, are uh, typically sent by a physician or a provider or a case manager, some, someone on the clinical team that provides educational or encouraging or challenging messages to the patient. So, 
Examples include uh, text to quit, um, text for baby, where you're trying to reach the patient where they're at and target behavioral change uh, kind of, again, wherever they are with their phone. So if right before lunch you want to remind them to get their glucose reading or if you want to remind them to take their daily vitamin or if you want to remind them to walk an extra, you know, thousand steps today, however you're going to be targeting behavioral change, uh, it, it, you're doing it through these very simple messages. Now, the benefit of this, uh, there are several of them. One of them, you have minimal technological requirements. Your patients don't need to be on smartphones. And for those of us that are concerned about working with uh, underserved populations, uh, those that are, are socioeconomically disadvantaged, we have the benefit of not requiring them to get into expensive contracts that we are quite possibly having to subsidize. In this way, that they're getting simple texts with equipment they already have and are familiar with. So a lot of potential promise there. And this is focusing, again, on that patient-provider communication and helping them send data back and forth in a controlled and secure way. Uh, and there are secure messaging options that you should definitely be looking at if you're looking to do SMS messaging. Um, you should uh, not be doing these uh, unencrypted, unsecured. Uh, paying the, the money up front to uh, get a system certainly is a, a uh, smart choice from a, a HIPAA compliance standpoint. Now, where we see probably the most growth are in the data collection applications. Uh, a part of this is because we're reaching both patients and providers here. They, they each have their own different worlds and applications that they kind of inhabit. Uh, activity trackers are blowing up in a huge way. Everybody has, you know, whether it's uh, the uh, Nike or Withings or Fitbit, you know, a lot of trackers are coming out there. Uh, Apple coming out with its uh, new uh, Apple Watch. Um, a lot of calorie counters also uh, kind of helping gather data. And increasingly we're seeing more and more medical device interfaces, especially over Bluetooth where these little devices, uh, you know, step on a scale and it sends it via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi to your phone, um, all, again, filtering into these electronic logs. And uh, there are a lot of examples of, of these products out there. And this is where we are maybe seeing the most churn, where a lot of people are kind of throwing stuff up and seeing what sticks. If there's an application that takes off in a successful way, um, then great, they'll continue to develop it. But if it is not really growing very rapidly or making many sales, a lot of times the developers just kind of stop supporting it, which is its own problem because that means that our marketplace then, whether it's the App Store, Play Store, Windows Store, any of these mobile stores, they're increasingly full of dead or abandoned projects uh, that are of minimal functionality and use. And we'll get more into that here later. But on the good side, I mean, there are a lot of options. There are a lot of things that you can do to help your patients gather better data. And then an extension of this are, are what we refer to as support apps, um, where it's kind of giving some context to the data uh, for caregivers, for patients, uh, for those that are in the, the network of care. And it, it can be done in a variety of ways, uh, you know, sharing results. So a you know, parent can share their results with their children or can get their the data from their child, kind of depending on, on the relationship there. And uh, you know, I, I kind of am hesitant to, to harp on the informing of noncompliance, but it can be quite nice. If you are a, a caregiver and you're trying to make sure that your you know, parent is being compliant with their medications uh, or with their you know, monitoring their blood pressure, uh, if you are part of some of these support applications, you can see if they have you know, missed a measurement, missed a medication, uh, and you can then follow up with them and try and intervene at an earlier time as opposed to waiting for the, the condition to deteriorate to a point where uh, more drastic support measures are required. Then the, this last bullet here is also, I think, quite important, providing information about the conditions. One of the big things that I like about mHealth is it's a potential to provide context to our patients, <clears throat> context about a lot of data that they're dealing with. Now, when a patient gets a new diagnosis, it's you know not uncommon for us to give them you know, one, two, three, maybe a dozen different papers talking about their medication, their treatment options, prognosis, uh, you know, how, what they should be doing for their medications and behavior changes. And so they get this big pile of documentation. And if we're lucky, they read it. If we're really lucky, they read it and file it away somewhere. But most often, it winds up in a circular somewhere. Maybe they read a piece or two of the, of the information. But they lose that information. And then if they're not going to see their physician for months at a time, then it means that they maybe are going to be uninformed about their care and about their condition. So if we take these support applications and kind of leverage the knowledge that they can provide 
it, it's a way to get more data to our patients uh, more, more quickly and kind of if we see a, a uh, result or, or a, a number that we don't quite like in their uh, M health data, you know, we can then send information to the patient and say, hey, you should read this. This will help you understand what your score means. Uh, and here's why you should be taking your medication. So th there's a lot of ways to get this, uh, the support of the, the care team and the, the caregivers all drawn together through mobile health. Now, the, the programs themselves run on a wide range of technologies. The hardware support, you know, that kind of comprises the M Health world is, um, well, it's sizable to say the least. The number of new products coming out with uh, a range of features and functions is mind-boggling. There are your basic and feature phones, your text, just your basic text messaging and phone calls, uh, a whole bunch of smartphones coming out. Uh, peripherals obviously being another growing area. And now this is both a, a, uh, uh, a boon and a burden. It, it's great that we have such a wide array of options. There are so many products that work across uh, mobile devices, and so uh, we aren't necessarily constrained to a single device. But this is a confounding issue for those of us that are trying to do assessment, because we now have to figure out what products to buy, what hardware it's supported on, and the testing potential grows extensively if we don't rein in the hardware selection up front. So, so this is a, a challenging space um, in that there's so much option for both the consumer and the physician. This wide-ranging uh, selection, the, the huge market, also applies to software. Uh, you know, all the manufacturers have their own app stores generally, and they have tens of thousands of applications related to mHealth. Again, choice is great, but the overwhelming flood of decisions that need to get made with little context is a problem right now. There are a lot of applications that just uh, are, are uh, hard, hard to kind of sort through. There are so many at this point, you can't possibly get through all of them on your own. Now, I'll talk about resources to help you out on that uh, here later, but it, it's a key part of it. The App Store environment and just the, the general software that's available is critical to uh, the, the mHealth uh, technologies. Now, one of the things you may come across in looking at a lot of the literature and a lot of the, the um, products that are out there, especially software applications, are these application programming interfaces, uh, or APIs, where <clears throat> it becomes possible to share your data or access through these APIs. And so kind of approved relationships can be set up with the, the software so you can get your activity data brought into your calorie counting data or your calorie data brought into your general wellness uh, application. And these little APIs are, are really great, but they also have some problems in that if, let's say, I am a very important manufacturer producing a lot of, uh, uh, or a lot of hooks into other applications and my API is widely used, if I then change my API, all of a sudden I've broken the relationship to all the other applications out there. And this has happened time and time again, where we have a very elaborate uh, kind of set of tools in place in a phone, one of them changes an API, and then all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. So it, this puts some burden on those of us doing mHealth deployments because not only do we have to make sure we pick the right hardware, we now have to be sure that we pick the right software and that we thoroughly vet any upgrades to the software because it could be quite unfortunate if key functionality is broken that was dependent on these potentially changing APIs. Now, I think that this area is potentially going to get a lot better now that both Apple and Google are stepping into the you know, personal health market with uh, um, HealthKit and uh, Google Fit, where they're essentially saying, this is the structure and the format of data that we want. If your application wants to give us the data, it has to follow these rules. So all of a sudden, the, the uh, kind of data is getting funneled into a very narrow pipe that is very well typed and defined, which I think is going to be huge in the future and gives me a lot of hope in maybe helping clarify some of the, the noise that we're facing in the app market. Now, pretty much all of these are dependent upon servers somewhere. Uh, not all of them, but generally speaking, the applications are, I mean, they're capturing data locally and then sending it to uh, a physician somewhere else, and it's typically being sent and routed through a server, usually with some kind of dashboard interface or way of looking at the data. But I don't want to spend too much time digging into this. I just want to point out that it's not, I mean, mHealth isn't just uh, phones and peripherals and apps. 
there's this whole other infrastructure that is often needed to support it. Now, typically, you aren't going to have to host that infrastructure yourself. A lot of these systems are cloud-based, um, where they've got uh, scalable infrastructure that you know, will support your individual program's needs. That's not to say, however, that uh, all the applications are done that way. There are plenty of systems that allow you to, uh, or uh, allow and or require you to support your own server uh, to, to do uh, all of the, the data management and transport. <clears throat> Now, TTAC has been involved in testing this stuff here for a couple of years now. Uh, we have looked at quite a few devices. Um, generally speaking, uh, blood pressure monitors, body fat analyzers, scales, glucometers, activity trackers, dermoscopes, otoscopes, ophthalmoscopes, a couple of wearables, and most notably the Google Glass, and then uh, stands and cases, including another one uh, that, that recently that is a uh, kind of pan and tilt uh, mount for a tablet so you can do video conferencing and still maintain a uh, pan and tilt. So a whole, a whole host of things ranging from the more clinical to the more administrative and just generally useful. Uh, and then plenty of devices that, uh, no offense to the manufacturers, um, are not that useful. We have spent a ton of hours looking at a ton of devices, and uh, there's a lot of neat stuff out there, but there are also a fair share of headaches. Now, the couple of the key takeaways that we've seen here are that the application quality can vary widely. It is insane the uh, number of defects that we found in certain applications that are out there to the point where the applications are not usable. Uh, and this can likely be chalked up to changes in operating systems where they may have had a great product one or two operating systems ago, but as the phone uh, 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 operating system upgrades and it's changed, all of a sudden there can be problems imposed. Uh, or they're developed for a newer one and fail to account for the fact that people still might be running you know, two, three, or four-year-old uh, uh, operating systems on their phones. So if, if you look at this image here on the left, you see buttons overlaying buttons, so you can't click the one behind it. You see the jumble of text up top because all of the labels were kind of smooshed together. <clears throat> Things like that make the application essentially unusable. Other systems are, uh, have you know, pretty charts and are very usable. Uh, some of them focus more on being incredibly beautiful, but not necessarily providing actionable data. And so you have this huge, huge range of quality. And as you're looking at tens of thousands of applications, that makes it an almost impossible task of trying to figure out what application you should actually be using. Another big thing here is that there are really great devices, you know, peripheral devices that have generally less than desirable software. Uh, to, to maybe put it bluntly, some of them have terrible software. Likewise, there are really great applications out there that just have horrible device support. Uh, either the device they come with doesn't work very well, or the devices that try and you know, work with their software aren't really great. <clears throat> so the, the big thing is that it's still incredibly, incredibly variable. Now, I would say a lot of the reason for this is that it's a young market. Uh, there is a ton of hype here, where a lot of application developers are kind of throwing stuff to see what sticks, things that don't stick fall into the big pit of App Store mess. <clears throat> and there's some issues also where the low cost of being able to develop these software applications have enabled people who don't have the clinical background that traditionally you would find in, in healthcare software markets. Uh, these are people who are good at app development for phones and go, healthcare is pretty important, or I've got a sick kid, gee, I should make an app for that. So a, a ton of hype. Uh, a couple of things I want to point out here. Uh, one of them is, is the report by the IMS Institute for Healthcare Informatics. They put out the uh, patient apps for improved healthcare, where they looked at all of the applications I believe on the app store, on the uh, Apple App Store, and they uh, that tout were claimed to be healthcare related, and they reviewed all uh, of the the many tens of thousands of applications, found most of them to be junk, uh, or they're not actively used or downloaded. They then went through that remaining half of them and kind of parsed them out by type and um, functionality. And really, they did an amazing study, well worth taking a read. Uh, it was from October of 2013, so the information already may be getting a bit dated. But the general trends that they point out are absolutely spot on. Now, <clears throat> there's the uh, Gartner Hype Cycle, uh, which is a great annual report that comes out looking at the status of technologies across a wide range of sectors. And they've done that for uh, mHealth. 
And here we are seeing uh, mHealth on what they refer to as the peak of inflated expectations. There's been a huge amount of press and buzz and excitement around mHealth, but it hasn't necessarily delivered on it quite yet. So <clears throat> unfortunately, what we're probably approaching is the trough of disillusionment, where all the excitement kind of wanes as people realize that we aren't quite there yet. We've been talking like mHealth has arrived, but I would argue that it maybe is still in that process of arriving. So we have some pain ahead of us as we try and figure out what we should be doing and how we should be doing it. <clears throat> the good news, though, is that Gartner typically sees the technology follow the same, same cycle of hitting a, a peak, dropping down to be maybe a little disappointing or underwhelming, and then as people really figure out the true use cases and figuring out the best ways to kind of maximize the utility of the software and hardware, they then get to these great uh, uh, points of productivity and improvement. Now, this has had a, an interesting relationship with the regulations, specifically around FDA. There was a lot of hesitation to really jump into this market a while ago because there was a concern that the FDA would come in and uh, uh, regulate fairly extensively those people developing mobile applications. And in September of 2013, they put a guidance out that essentially said that they aren't going to uh, provide any undue or over, overly onerous oversight of uh, mHealth application developers. Now, if you're, if you're taking medical data and actually capturing it w with your own devices, and that is still going to be regulated, but if you're just kind of moving data around from other people and other cleared devices, they're not going to be too concerned about you. And uh, likewise, the medical device data systems, or MDDS, uh, is another one of those systems where <clears throat> they're basically saying, if you're just moving data around, we're not going to regulate you too heavily. They're saying that they you know, will, will, won't regulate you know, forever and ever into the future. They're simply saying that right now they view them in, these applications as being a significantly uh, uh, low enough of a risk where they're not going to, to um, be too much of a burden because they don't want to stifle innovation. But I would argue that this recent uh, kind of uh, change in tone, or at least clarification in tone, has led to this hype because more and more people are getting into it because the risk is now lower for the app developer. Another thing driving the hype uh, are the changing financial models that we see. <clears throat> the rise in account accountable care organizations, uh, where organizations are uh, kind of being paid based on um, a set amount for each patient, and so if you can find a way to reduce the, the number of uh, hospital visits for your patient, that means that you are receiving more money, you're retaining more money uh, over the course of the, the uh, patient's uh, illness, which is, is quite compelling. So people or organizations are realizing that spending one or two hundred dollars on a device that might keep a patient out of the hospital is an absolutely worthwhile investment because those hospital visits are eating away at their profits. Uh, so, so that will be an interesting thing to continue to watch. I think that will drive mHealth uh, in r quite remarkable and rapid ways. Likewise, we're seeing the CMS penalties for 30-day re uh, readmissions, where uh, as people are kind of getting hit with financial fines, they're trying to find ways that they can uh, cheaply avoid them. And I would say that mHealth is proving p promising. Uh, and so again, this is p helping hype the market, I think, quite a bit. Uh, and then you can go down the list here even further, employ wellness programs and various insurance programs that might uh, offer discounts for those that choose to use mHealth applications. Uh, so all these things are coming together to change how um, mHealth really is viewed and applied. But we still have this issue of how do we do technology assessments for mobile? How do we pick the right equipment? Now, for this, TTAC has a few processes that we like to recommend. Uh, generally speaking, we, we have a, a set guideline that we think can be fit to pretty much any technology out there um, with you know, minor, minor modifications depending on the product. Uh, we'll point out a few challenges that we see uh, related to mHealth. Kind of as we go through the process, we'll call out mHealth specifically and say, this is why this works or why this doesn't work or why this is important or less important or difficult, what have you. And then I'll give you a few, a few resources that you can turn to later uh, as, you, as we try and figure out how to help you do tech assessment in the future. So this is TTAC's seven easy steps to better technology assessment. We recommend that you establish requirements, review the market, procure the devices, plan the test, test the plan, select your device, and then deploy and support it. Now, I'm, uh, 
going to go into all of these here in a moment. <clears throat> One of the big things to point out, though, is that we have um, the ideal model here where you do all of these things, but in all honesty, most organizations find it difficult to do all of them every time. Uh, but I really recommend trying to build these practices into your technology assessment uh, world because in the clinical environment, we're always looking at new equipment, whether it's telemedicine or other uh, medical peripherals or medical devices or computing equipment, what have you, we really need to, to kind of have a solidified assessment process in place. So, so let's dive into that process a bit further. Kind of the first thing out the gate that I recommend is establish requirements. Uh, get input from all the stakeholders, and then create shared meaning around those requirements. Now, the second step, I think, is really critical because people typically are going to get all the requirements out. You'll have a, a technical person saying, it has to do X. A clinician might say, oh, yeah, he's right, it has to do X. And they're both not in agreement saying, we're on the same page, this is wonderful. The issue is that what means X to the, to the patient, or excuse me, to the technician, and X to the clinician, those might be widely different concepts. So really spending time to dig into the requirements I think is very important uh, and will help reduce confusion down the assessment road. Now the input you get from your stakeholders, it's difficult here in the mHealth world because I don't think that people necessarily have an understanding of what they want to do with mHealth. Maybe they've heard, the, heard of mHealth and they like the idea of it and so they say, hey, we should be doing mHealth. Or potentially they have a very clear clinical use case but that use case might not extend very well to other programs. So, so at this point in mHealth, I, I think that it's especially critical to get all of the requirements that you need, but I think it's also going to be a little bit more exasperating and frustrating because the requirements themselves are still being defined. People are trying to figure out how to develop these effective mHealth programs. So you may have to expect a little bit of extra work on this side of things. Now, reviewing the market in some telehealth fields is difficult just because there aren't a lot of manufacturers and it's hard to see what really is available, not because there just aren't resellers or, or kind of postings of devices. We have the exact opposite problem here in mHealth. You can find a million opinions about pretty much every device out there, software application reviews, hardware reviews. Uh, as this hits the consumer market, it just absolutely exploded in this kind of flurry of activity and opinions and concepts. And so now reviewing the market, it has a different challenge in that you have to wade through a lot of noise to figure out what really is out there. Uh, there are a pile of applications and devices that are uh, what's referred to as vaporware, uh, not software, but vaporware, because it's intangible, it doesn't exist. There's a great promise there, but it isn't delivered. Um, and I have a whole pile of devices that I've uh, pre-ordered or uh, kind of uh, have reserved you know, to, to receive one when they actually come out but I haven't received it, you know, a year after reserving it. So it is an issue uh, in that the market is so noisy right now. Uh, and contacting manufacturers and vendors, sometimes that's really easy in the, uh, in the telemedicine world uh, because there are a handful of players and they uh, are usually quite willing to talk to you, talk about their product, talk about the market generally. Within uh, the mobile world, I don't expect you're going to call up Apple and get um, a, a great amount of information from them about their product and how it impacts M health. Uh, however, there are manufacturers and vendors that certainly will uh, meet these expectations and needs. I'm just saying that it, it will be different with M health, at least for a while, until things get a little bit more sorted out. Now, device procurement here uh, is, I think, an important part in any assessment. Obviously, getting the devices into play with them is critical, but the timing and how you do it is also important. Um, because one thing that we found time and time again is that we'll have our test plan, we'll have everything kind of figured out, we'll get the devices in, and then we'll suddenly realize that, wow, these products do something we didn't even think was possible. This is now a critical requirement. All devices need to do this. If you have devices kind of coming in in a haphazard and ad hoc fashion, it means that you're going to wind up sending one of them back uh, then you find out about this killer application or killer feature, and now you have to go back and try and get that other device back into your shop so you can look at it and see if it really does what you need it to do. So having things sta staggered can be a little bit of a, a problem. Uh, getting them all in at once can be its own separate problem because all of these or all these products have their own manuals, cases, cables, chargers, attachments, and all of that. And so you need to be very organized when they come in 
uh, so you don't get things confused, lost, and or broken. Now, planning the test can take place gradually, starting pretty much from requirements on. Maybe it happens after you get the devices in. However you do it, you want to quantify your requirements, uh, and, and you want to really be clear as to what it is that you're going to uh, be testing. And then more than just getting, getting a clarification as to what you want to test, explain how you want to test it, especially if you're working in an environment where you have multiple testers who might have different opinions as to how they should be utilizing the systems. So if you can explain to them, here is the use case that we need you to test. Don't limit them, or if they want to go crazy and keep testing as much as they want, that's fine, but have a clear and concise test plan that you'll try to stick to as best as you can. Now, I say stick to as best as you can because this is likely going to be iterative. You're going to, as I said, get that application in, get that product in, and go, wow, this is a killer app. I needed all applications to do this. So you have to go back and update your test plan accordingly. Now, uh, a big thing here is documenting everything. Um, the institutional memory can be relied only so far. And so if you've been doing a lot of technology assessments, You'll get everyone to kind of nod their head and go, okay, I remember that. Yeah, we decided a year ago we weren't going to do that. And then someone will ask that confounding, difficult question of why? Why did we decide that? Um, and if, or, or the manufacturer will come out and say, ah, but it's new and improved version 2.0. Definitely you know, buy our product. If you don't have things documented, you won't be able to ask them that pointed question and say, oh, we disliked this about your product. Have you remedied that? Um, so, so documentation and keeping it organized are, are, once again, a very key thing. And then device selection. Obviously, if you're doing an assessment, it's with the end goal of being able to pick a product. Uh, this is where getting all your reviewers together can be quite important. Within mHealth, uh, it, it, this can be a little bit difficult uh, because if you're trying to do deploy an mHealth solution that touches multiple specialties, uh, and has a patient-facing uh, component, provider-facing component, an administrative component. Everyone's going to have their own opinion as to what it actually needs to do. And so you might have some scores that are just wildly, wildly different um, and will require a bit of extra discussion and hashing it out to figure out why people thought what they thought. And again, this points to documentation being important. If you haven't documented it, you're, you may wind up uh, forgetting key things that you really need to remember about why you rejected that product. Now, deploying and support typically is comprised of a whole bunch of activities, ranging from device staging, configuring the equipment, procuring spares, establishing warranties and when they kick off, uh, doing customer support and troubleshooting, training, replacing that equipment, all of that. And this is absolutely true for, for mobile health as well. Um, and having a clear plan in place to how you're going to deploy this stuff, how you're going to support it at the, both the patient side and the provider side, which that can be complex. I mean, how are you providing patient support? I mean, many organizations have never had to provide support to a patient in this way. Uh, in the health system, absolutely, we support them as much as they need, but support you on how to use your phone so you can give us data, that could be tricky, but if we need to keep them compliant uh, with the, you know, whatever measuring and monitoring we're asking them to do, well, we absolutely need to be ready to support them as users. And then there's one bullet missing from this uh, that I think is fairly unique to mHealth in comparison to other telehealth fields. And that is the need for some kind of, I guess, mHealth formulary uh, where an organization can come together and say, look, we absolutely support uh, cardiologists using this hardware product on these two phones with this software in this configuration and this is the, the blessed system that we use. And when a patient comes in, we can say, OK, uh, if you're going to be my patient, I need you to download this application and utilize it, et cetera, et cetera. So, so <coughs> that is a, a, uh, an element that's unique to mHealth, I would say, at this moment. Now, assuming you've done all of that, you've deployed your product, it's a wonderful success, that's all great. But to get, before we get to that point, there are a few things that we need to address. One of them is the fact that there's a lack of clear use cases for mobile services right now. Uh, this isn't to say that people aren't doing really awesome things with mobile. There is great stuff taking place, successful programs all over, but we're still in the point, at the point where we're defining things as we go. And so for those organizations that aren't necessarily 
uh, willing to be on you know, the bleeding edge of technology, uh, kind of the forefront of cutting edge technology, it, it is difficult for them to figure out how they fit into this world. Um, and, and so it might not be appropriate for some organizations to really be seriously investing in uh, mobile for telehealth and mobile health solutions uh, until they have a better sense of what they really want to do with it. And uh, it's totally okay to say, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and support, you know, doctors on smartphones at a basic level, but until we figure out what clinical workflows and technical workflows and security systems we have in place, until then, we aren't going to die of whole hog into it. So that's an important thing to address um, yeah, as you look at uh, dealing with M Health. When your organization does decide to move into mobile, I, I really strongly recommend the need to make a mobile plan at the organizational level as to who gets what devices with what level of support. Is the organization subsidizing devices? Are they recommending bring your own device? Are they buying devices? Are you expecting patients and providers to have two phones, one for their clinical services and one for personal use or administrative use? Uh, a whole pile of questions as to uh, how the technology should be deployed and controlled. You know, are you going to uh, force remote wiping if the phone is lost? Are you going to enable that? Um, which is a, a difficult question because if a provider is using this both for work and for personal uh, you know, home life, they might be a little bit upset if you wipe their phone uh, because you may have just gotten rid of their, you know, one year, their, their uh, one year birthday for their baby, or it might be that they lost a whole bunch of personally critical uh, data. Uh, so you, you really want to be careful there to make sure that you have a clear plan and then communicate that plan to your uh, your, your uh, patients and providers. And then you know, I mentioned that it was a, a positive thing generally the changing in technology and regulations and finance. Um, in that things are moving in a positive direction. But I would say that it's still a challenge because anytime that you have change, it introduces a level of uncertainty. And healthcare is a notoriously risk-averse uh, um, operation. And so if there's change and uncertainty, some organizations are really going to struggle figuring out how to engage with these things. And so uh, once again, this may be a situation where in some settings, or it's totally okay to say, we aren't going to engage with this yet for these reasons. Um, and then, I mean, what you should be doing is spending a very concerted effort uh, on uh, kind of getting rid of those hurdles and burdens, excuse me, uh, 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 hurdles and burdens um, that are kind of blocking you from really adopting it fully. Now, there is a lot that could go into any discussion on technology assessment. And this was a, a bit of a cursory overview uh, if you are looking for more information on technology assessment, especially in the mHealth world, please feel free to either email me directly or call me uh, or go to our website. We have a bunch of uh, uh, toolkits that discuss various technologies. We have media available for viewing and download if you want to see how different imaging uh, tools compare or data sets compare. A lot of stuff on our website. Now, we are TRC. Uh, this here presentation is actually a part of the NRTRC uh, their webinar series. There are 12 regional TRCs around the U.S., uh, so uh, feel free to contact a regional uh, uh, TRC if you have a need to. Uh, there are also two national TRCs. There's the one that I'm running, the, the TTAC, that is focusing strictly on technology, and then there's the Center for Connected Health Policy that is focusing, well, as you might expect, on policy issues at a national level. Now, this is a great resource. I don't know how many of you are really fully familiar with uh, the, the resource centers. We're an amazing network that works really well together. So one of the benefits here happens to be that if you have a question, you can ask any one of us. Uh, you can ask your regional TRC, and if they don't have an answer, they can turn to the power of the network, and we'll usually find an answer to pretty much any question that gets thrown our way. Uh, so great resource. Definitely recommend uh, going to their website, telehealthresourcecenter.org. Now, there are other resources out there right now. There's imedicalapps.com, Mobi Health News, that both are providing you know, news and reviews of a couple of applications. There are other systems out there called, uh, one, a, a, a kind of popular one right now is called Haptic. There are other systems that, that are uh, in the works as well. Uh, I believe the, the IMS, the Institute for Healthcare Informatics, also has a service similar to this, where they essentially help you select the right applications for your clinical needs. They do some of the, the grunt work on evaluating what's out there. They have a, an approved or recommended set of, of applications and devices you work with. 
Um, so it helps relieve some of that burden for the you know overwhelmed provider. So you don't get step into this huge field at a field and get overwhelmed. You turn to one of these service providers and kind of get their their input and their consultation. There's the ATA M Health SIG uh, that has a lot of discussion on these topics. Uh, there's a, a recent publication that came out through NIST, uh, special publication 800-163, which is uh, called the, uh, it's a draft uh, document right now, uh, Technical Considerations for Vetting Third-Party Mobile Applications. And this gets into a bunch of the more technical nitty-gritty details of doing an assessment. Uh, I really recommend that you look at it, uh, both to provide feedback if, if you desire to, but also just to get a good sense of how they approach this uh, they have very specific tests they recommend. They look a lot at security issues, which is very important with mobile. Uh, and really, they have a, a quite a good, good uh, document there. And then, as I mentioned, also the IMS Institute for Healthcare Informatics has their uh, patient apps for improved healthcare document that's also freely available. So there's a lot out there. And then the literature is growing quite extensively at, at the kind of peer-reviewed side of things. So a lot of good stuff to turn to. Um, and with that, I open the floor to any questions that anyone might have. Uh, and thank you very much for your time today. Well, Garrett, thanks. I don't suspect we'll have very many questions uh, at this point, but I just want to re repeat what you said earlier, that anybody that's watching this uh, recording of the, of the webinar is welcome to contact either Garrett directly or me, and I'll contact Garrett on your behalf. We're, uh, we're here to help. We're happy to do what we can. And Garrett, I want to thank you very much for joining us today and sharing this information. I really agree with you that mobile health, dumb health is going to be the big thing in the future. And it's nice to know that, that somebody out there is thinking about a roadmap for, uh, for health care providers to use to, to get secure and, and appropriate patient care. So with that, we're going to stop the recording, and this web webinar will be available on our website, uh, nrtrc.org, uh, just as soon as our server gets it recorded and, and translated. Yes, thank you very much for joining us.